Um, it is a great pleasure <laughs> to introduce Huda Zogby for the second time. Um, and for those of you who weren't here yesterday, let me just do my introduction very briefly. Huda is a professor at the Baylor, Baylor College of Medicine. She's an investigator with HHMI, a member of the National Academy, and founding director of the Neurological Research Institute at Texas Children's Hospital. Um, she, her work really has, uh, begins with trying to understand disease and its a fundamental molecular basis, and she's done spectacularly well on multiple fronts. Um, in honor of that, she won the 2017 Breakthrough Prize in Life Sciences. And I, I think it's particularly apt that she is here today to give Steenbach lectures, since Steenbach also um, was remarkable in his ability to, to identify a molecular basis of uh, rickets in particular. And um, can't have a Steenbach lecture without showing Steenbach, um, who was, um, got his degree here in 1908 and was a professor in the first half of uh, the last century, so it's a while ago now. But he's uh, basically responsible for the founding of WARF uh, with his own personal funds, and we owe him a tremendous uh, debt of gratitude. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Huda, who uh, will give her second lecture, and I'm really excited. Thank you so much, Judith. I have to say, um, as the second day is starting to wind down, I'm starting to feel sad, because I actually had such a wonderful time here, meeting with faculty and getting to know. Uh, is this better? Can you hear me better now? He'll turn it up. OK. Great. I, I hope, can you hear me now? Wonderful. So what I'm trying to say is I'm really sad that my trip is coming to an end because I thoroughly, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I, I really loved every visit I had with the different faculty and just getting to learn about medicine and the great science that's happening here. So I feel very honored to be the Steambox lecturer and to have spent time with you and appreciate all of you for making time for me. So um, before I tell you about the work, I would just like to give you a disclosure, particularly regarding my collaboration with UCB, because as you'll hear about the work today, it's some of the work we've done. They have helped uh, support and advance towards the development of therapeutics. And um, other affiliations, there are really no financial um, monies that come from Ionis, but we heard the work yesterday, we collaborate with them, and then I have a couple of advisory board uh, responsibilities. So um, the, the talk today will tell you about my journey with a rare disease, but I hope that it will sort of show you how when we study some rare diseases, we might have a better handle on them than the more common diseases. Uh, of course, the most common neurodegenerative diseases are Alzheimer and Parkinson's disease, but for the majority of Alzheimer and Parkinson, they're sporadic disorders. We don't really have a handle about the molecular basis. There are few familial cases with maybe 5% of Alzheimer and Parkinson are genetically determined. Uh, but it's those rare diseases that are helping us understand the pathogenesis. And today, I'm going to tell you about a really rare disorder that uh, we study. And I hope by the end of the talk, you'll see that some of the lessons we learned from this disease might actually have implication for the broader and more common and less understood neurodegenerative diseases. So spinal cerebellar ataxia is a balanced disorder. It is dominantly inherited. It's extremely rare, much rarer than Rett syndrome, affects one in 100,000 people. And the people typically are healthy till they're about 30 or 40 years old when they start losing their balance. And they'll have balance problem, as you see these two individuals in the picture, using a walker to get around for about 10 to 15 years before they become wheelchair bound. And once they become wheelchair bound, additional parts of their nervous system function deteriorate. And that's the ability to swallow and speak. Uh, 
easily and the swallowing difficulty lead to choking and recurrent infection and unfortunately premature death. This is the project that I worked on because there was no way in 1985 to really focus your career on a sporadic disorder such as Rett syndrome. I mentioned to you yesterday, my mentor said, find another project, find a Mendelian project. And this is the Mendelian project. As you would look at this pedigree, you will see that there are multiple individuals. The filled circles and squares are affected people. And you'll see this is a family that lives in Houston, about 50 miles north of Houston. They have this disease. There were about a couple hundred members that uh, I was able to identify, examine, and or obtain history about. And what you'll see clearly that this family, as the disease progresses, the onset uh, also happens to be earlier and earlier. So these individual had disease onset in their 70s, the next generation their 50s. Most of the people I examined are from this generation down with onset in their 40s or 30s. And those in the last generation, they're beginning to have onset as children, four-year-old, 10-year-old, 17-year-old. And this phenomena of anticipation, uh, it's called as such because it's almost like a clinical anticipation, that when you know your father has the disease, you start looking for symptoms and recognizing the symptoms early, or the physician might anticipate it early. And that may have a little bit to do with it. You might notice if you're a little bit uncoordinated when the family history is positive. But I think what you need to know is that the death is much earlier. So the person who had disease in their 70s die when they were 85 or 90. So that's practically a normal lifespan. Whereas those children, they were all dead by 20 years of age or younger. So it's the age of onset as well as the age of death. And you know, my lab has mapped the gene to chromosome 6, and we were trying to walk closer and closer. We got it down to a million base pairs. And we collaborated with Harry Orr at the University of Minnesota, who also had a family, similarly had multiple affected individuals. And he and I were, were walking towards the gene and looking to find the gene. And one day I hear a seminar at Baylor College of Medicine by Tom Kasky describing how they discovered the mutational basis of myotonic dystrophy. And as a neurologist, I knew exactly what happens in myotonic dystrophy. You have anticipation. The mother could be fine, but the baby will have disease at birth. And he found out that the repeats are smaller in the mother, but thousands expansion happens in the children and immediately recognize this as possibly this is the phenomena. So while Harry and I were trying to find the gene in that million base pair, it immediately inspired us to look at CAG or CAG, any type of repeat expansion. So he and I decided to split the region in half and start looking in the region for repeat expansion. The region was one megabase. We did not want to miss anything. So I said, why don't we make sure there's a 75 kilobase of overlap as we screen for these uh, potential repeats in the DNA of the patients. And that we did, and we discovered the mutation on the same day in both of our respective laboratory. And the mutation happened to be in the 75 kilobase region of overlap. So that was the culmination of a five years collaboration. And this year marked our, our 25th year collaboration. We started collaborating before the gene was discovered. And I was so thrilled that we discovered it together. So the, the CAG repeat that's expanded can be typically 30. It can be as little as 6 and as high as 39 in healthy individuals. But in patients with the ataxia, it's usually 39 perfect repeats or more. And this is uh, 39 repeats causes late onset disease, where the 82 younger onset repeat. The repeat fell within the coding region of a protein that at the time when we did BLAST, there was nothing like it. So we had no homology to anything. First ataxia gene clone, called it ataxin 1, for lack of a better name. And that's how our study started. And this slide shows you now my SCA1 family that I shared with you. And here are the individuals that had their disease onset later, 60s, uh, 40s, and so on. And you'll see they had a repeat size in the 40s. 
where here are the children, and you'll see they had repeat site 70, and uh, in this case, uh, 75. And here's one, our youngest patient ever. She had 82 repeats, and she had an onset at four years of age. So the longer the repeat, the younger the age of onset, and the more severe the disease. At the, at the time we cloned SCA1, there was only one other polyglutamine disease, the androgen receptor, and Huntington got cloned about the same time. And since then, there are now nine polyglutamine diseases. The red triangle is where the polyglutamine tract is. And all you have to know is that there are proteins of various sizes, various functions, quite different. Here's a calcium channel for SCA6 and uh, TATA binding protein, transcriptional regulator, and so on and so forth. So they're very different proteins. And therefore, people really focus on the polyglutamine tract. And many of them are called ataxins because they all called at caused ataxia. So there are multiple ataxias now caused by polyglutamine. But they're really different. They don't share anything amongst them, only the polyq expansion. So therefore, there were many, many studies for a year that focused on the polyq expansion being the entity driving the toxicity. And today, I'll share with you what we've learned and uh, how fascinating it is. So today, what I'd like to tell you is tell you about the molecular mechanism. How does a polyq expansion cause neuronal degeneration? I also would like to share with you a new discovery we made about why is it that in this disease, where the protein is widely expressed, it's in every cell of the brain, yet we see degeneration in the Purkinje cells of the cerebellum, as well as a few brainstem neurons and maybe some hippocampal cells? Why is it that we don't see it in other uh, cell type? Uh, similarly, for example, Huntington is widely expressed, but you don't see Purkinje cell degeneration. So what drives the cell-specific degeneration? I hope to share with you one story about that. And then now that we understand these two things, what can one do about modulating the course of the disease? And finally, to go back where we started, is something we're learning from SC1 going to be relevant to other neurodegenerative diseases? So focusing on the mechanism, uh, when we found this gene, the first thing we wanted to know, could the polyq expansion be causing loss of function of the protein? So the, the simplest thing to do is to delete the gene in the mouse, and the mouse has normally 2q. When we deleted the gene of the mouse, the mouse did not have any of the ataxia phenotypes that we see in the human patients. They had slight learning and memory deficit, but no SCA1 phenotype. The next thing we did is we put a knock in an expanded repeat within the endogenous SCA1 locus. And when we put 154 glutamines into the CAG repeat within that locus, replace the 2Q with CAG, we're expressing it from one allele in the right spatial temporal expression. We now reproduced all the features of the human disease. So you might say, well, she's lucky. Every time she makes a mouse model, like with the rat and others, she gets a mouse that reproduces all the features of the disease. Not so quick. I'll have to tell you, our first mouse was 82 repeat, because that was the largest repeat we observed in a human patient, if you recall our age of onset curve. And the mouse did not have any of the human features. And we were frustrated after two years of waiting for that mouse. And the reason is, it did. if you homozygous the allele and wait two years, you'll get some coordination problem. But who, which postdoc is going to work on a mouse that has a phenotype that begins at two years of age? Well, when we reflected on it, as I told you, the 82 repeats cause disease in a four-year-old individual, and the mice only live two-year-olds. So the time that the neuron exposed to this toxic protein is a factor. So all we did was we took the human family's data and extended the curve to see when might we see a phenotype within a couple of months. And that's how we came with the 154 repeat. So I just wanted to share that not every mouse we made is immediately great. We have to think about it, think about the biology, and we finally get it. So now that we had a good mouse model, we begin to investigate the mechanism. And one of the earlier studies on the mechanism was a taxon we knew nothing about. So one simple thing we asked, who does it interact with? And this is work we've done um, 
in cells initially and using yeast to hybrid. And using both of those uh, studies, one protein that we identified is called Capicua homolog. Capicua was initially described in the fruit flies, and I'll tell you a little bit more about it. And you can see here, when we did this tandem affinity purification in cells, we purified a taxon 1. Uh, a taxon 1 was the tagged protein. We identified two isoforms of Capicua, a long and short. And the other protein that came was 14.33 and HSP70. So, we found that in fruit flies, Capicua mo modulated the toxicity of ataxin 1. S and we found that it interacted with a domain within ataxin 1 that eventually we discovered actually has homology. By the time we began these studies, we now learned there is an ataxin 1 paralog that we that's now called ataxin 1 like. And the two proteins only share this what's called a taxon 1 homology domain, because that's the only domain they share. And this is the protein a domain that interacted with Capicua, where there is a small region here uh, within the Capicua uh, a protein that's conserved among the two splice isoform that interacted uh, with a taxon 1. So what is Capicua? It's an effector of the RAS MAP kinase signaling pathway. It was discovered, as I mentioned, in Drosophila. Loss of function of Capicua caused embryo patterning abnormalities, wing vein abnormalities, and uh, some intestinal cell stem cell proliferation uh, defect. Essentially, it was shown that Capicua is a repressor, and uh, it is inhibited by the uh, uh, EGFR, uh, ERCRIS, uh, EGFR receptors, and upon activation of these receptors, basically um, you, you inhibit Capicua. When it's not uh, inhibited, Capicua will be phosphorylated and, sorry, when it is inhibited, it will be phosphorylated and degraded, whereas when it's not inhibited, it acts as a co-repressor and a taxon 1 is in a complex. We went into the cerebellum and we found they are in a complex together. So what did we learn <laughs> happens in the poly-Q expanded at axon 1? What we learned is that that normal function, the ataxin 1 capicua complex, is now exaggerated in SC1. When you have a poly-Q expansion, you have increased repression on some target genes. So when you have this kind of result, you wonder what happens if we reduce the levels of capicua by 50%. And when we did that, what we discovered that reducing Capicua levels by 50% rescued the Purkinje cell degeneration. So this is a Purkinje cell count in wild-type animal in the Capicua heads. And in the SCA1 knock in mice, you see a reduction here of the Purkinje cells degeneration, as you can see on this calbindin staining. But when you reduce Capicua levels, you rescue some of that phenotype. You rescue the pathology, we rescued the ataxia, all the behavior coordination deficit were released. Because Capicua is a repressor, we can now look at what happens to genes that may be altered in SCA1. And here what you see is a handful of examples where there are some genes. The black is the wild type level. You see, because Capicua is a repressor, when you knock out Capicua, these genes will go up, as you would predict from a typical repressor. And what you see in the SCA1 knock in mice, these same genes are hyper repressed. And when we take away one copy of Capicua, we now correct that hyper repression to where it's back to normal. So this suggested to us this gain of function of the complex leading to hyper repression, repression got rescued by decreasing Capicua and rescued the phenotype. But what was also interesting we found that some of the genes that normally repressed by Capicua, they were now derepressed in the knock in animals, and they actually got worse about taking on one copy of Capicua. So, what this told us, there's also a loss of function of this complex on some targets. So, for some target, there was hyperrepression, and for so some target, there was some loss of function. Because all of the phenotypes, the Purkinje cell degeneration, the ataxia, were rescued. We believe it's the relief of the hyperrepression that stress you. But we could never be sure whether this loss of function of Capicua is contributing anything to the phenotype. 
So with this, we started new studies, and this is now, I'm, I sort of gave you the old background to give you some of the more recent work. What, what we decided to do with these new studies is first ask the question, we know now that gain of function of ataxin 1 causes disease, causes ataxia, but does loss of function of Capicua or ataxin 1 and its paralog para contribute to pathogenesis? And this is work done in different brain regions in the cerebellum by Maxime Russo and uh, Sean Lu, and in the cortex by Sean and in the hypothalamus by Truman Ten. So, and this is just to show you the brain regions where we deleted Capicua and or we deleted the two paralogs of ataxin 1, ataxin 1 and ataxin 1 like. Now you might ask me why not look at the constitutive knockout? Well, constitutive knockout of either Capicua or the ataxin 1 paralogs is lethal. Embryonic lethal, and they have, we published on that, they have lung defect, they have many other defects. So it's an essential gene. So we decided to focus on the brain. Take it out from the whole brain. The animals are very sick. They don't eat well. They die immediately after weaning. So then we focus on the forebrain, the hypothalamus, and the hindbrain, where we hit it in the cerebellum. And I'm going to show you these data to tell you whether there is loss of function contributions. So when we took it out from the hindbrain, what you'll see here is deletion of either ataxin 1 like or capicua. In this case, we're deleting ataxin 1 and ataxin 1 like and showing you the low protein levels. One thing you'll notice that by simply deleting ataxin 1 and 1 like, you significantly reduce capicua levels by 50% because they stabilize it in the complex. So this is another thing it tells us how dependent they are on each other. And when we delete Capicua, on the other hand, the stability of the ataxins is not affected, but you can see here major loss of Capicua. So now we have our animal models. What happens? Normal survival, normal activity, no coordination problem, Purkinje cells aging the animals to over a year, perfectly normal. So loss of the ataxin 1, 1 like paralog together from the cerebellum is not contributing to Purkinje cell degeneration. Same loss of Capicua does not contribute anything to Purkinje cell degeneration. How about the forebrain? I'm going to summarize the forebrain data in a cartoon. If you knock Capicua from the forebrain, what you cause is learning and memory problems. If you knock it out from the hypothalamus, you cause social behavior problems. The mouse doesn't interact with other mice as well. So when we saw hyperactivity and learning and memory problems, uh, we wondered if loss of Capicua in humans will cause disease. So we began looking and searching for patients who might have Capicua mutations that may cause loss of function. And indeed, we found them. Here are some sampling of these patients uh, with intellectual disability, autism, and seizures. Uh, here's intellectual disability and seizures, uh, more of the same autism. These are different patients. This parent was some, has probably germline mosaicism. This is what you see. All of these are de novo, but this one had germline mosaicism. Since then, we identified many more patients. There are even more than in this slides. Um, and you'll see most of these are either in conserved uh, amino acids or causing frame shifting, loss of function alleles. And these are the typical phenotypes. And one of the patient had ALL. One of the nine patients had leukemia. And whenever we observe something, as I shared with you yesterday, you do the mouse study, it tells you go look in a human, you find a human with a disease, then the human teaches you something more. Two things we learned here. We learned that there are seizures in five of the nine patients, and we learned that there is leukemia. Just recently, we discovered that the seizures happen from loss of the gene in inhibitory neurons. Because in the patients, it's haploinsufficiency through every brain cells. We did our knockout only in excitatory cells and glia. So we recently knocked out the gene in inhibitory neurons, and the animals had seizures, by EEG at least. So we think this will finally reproduce all the phenotype. But we also were interested in this phenotype. It could be by chance that this patient with haploinsufficiency had leukemia, or it could be actually due to the loss of Capicua. So we decided to test that hypothesis, 
by now deleting Capicua from adult animals after they are mature, use a tamoxifen Cree and see what happens. And when we deleted Capicua in adult animals, you'll see 100% penetrant phenotype of either T cell lymphoblastic leukemia or lymphoma. As you can see here, the postdoc Chumin really saw these big thymuses. And, uh, and you'll, you'll see here in the knockout uh, the lymphoma in these animals. So single gene loss caused leukemia and lymphoma in this mouse. We didn't have to sensitize the mouse model to anything. And we identified some of the mechanism by which this is happening, the molecular targets of Capicua that are driving this oncogenesis. The same is true for ataxin 1, ataxin 1-like. So deletion of ataxin 1, ataxin 1-like in adulthood. Also, the reason we did it in adulthood because I told you this is embryonic lethal. So probably what happened with the patient, she had one allele loss and probably in her bone marrow she had a second hit and unfortunately got her leukemia. So what we learned these from these studies is the complex has important functions during development. The forebrain knockout has neurobehavioral defect. And this complex is dispensable in cerebellar development. And that loss of function of the complex doesn't contrib contribute to SCA1. But haploinsufficiency of Capicia causes human disease, a neurobehavior phenotype in human, and drastic reduction of the complex in adulthood can cause cancer. So uh, this is what we learned about the normal function. Now, what causes the cell-specific degeneration? And for this, uh, we, got, we return to Capicua. I mentioned to you that ataxin 1 Capicua interact, and we map the interaction domain to the AXH domain on ataxin 1 in this region uh, on, on Capicua. That's a very small uh, peptide uh, portion of Capicua. And we collaborated with Ji Jung Sung to crystallize the two proteins, these two domains together. And he, he was able to do that and was able to pinpoint one amino acid on Capicua and two amino acids on ataxin 1 that are very critical for the interaction. So we got it down to one amino acid of Capicua. If you disrupt that amino acid of Capicua, you wipe out their interaction. We went back to the full-length proteins and tested it in the context of the full protein, and lo and behold, they lose the interaction, and two amino acids on ataxin 1. So now that I told you, gain of function of the ataxin 1 capicua complex drive disease, we can ask the question, does capicua play any role? Is it the only player in driving disease through a gain of function in Purkinje cells, or are there other gain of function interactions in the Purkinje cell? So to answer this, you can disrupt the ataxin 1 capicua interaction. And this we did in collaboration with Harry Orr and Tyler Tramperlin, who is a graduate student in his lab at the time, created transgenic mice, because they've already shown in their lab, if they express mutant ataxin 1 in the Purkinje cells, they get massive degeneration. And we knew it's a similar mechanism that involves capicua based on the repressed genes. So the question now, what happens if we mutate the amino acids on ataxin 1 that disrupt its interaction with Capicua and now express PolyQ expanded ataxin 1 with these two mutations? And to do this, what you have to know is that you really disrupted that interaction. And what you see here is that if we, uh, this is the input, but if we, so the input shows you that you express both of them equally express ataxin 1, whether this is the, um, mutant in the wild type. This is the, sorry, both are mutant with 82 glutamine, so long glutamine tract, but one has the amino acid interaction mutation. And now if you IP Capicua, what you'll see is you can bring down the ataxin 1 with just the expansion, but not the ataxin 1 that has the mutation that disrupt uh, its interaction. So we, we can show, and this is work by uh, Vitaly Bondar in our lab, who was at the time a graduate student. And you'll see here, you pretty much wipe out that interaction. Although the amount of the protein and the RNA, both of those make equal amount of protein, equal amount of RNA. So it's not because we're expressing less of the gene, it's really simply because we cannot interact. So what happened to the phenotype? 
And when we measure their coordination on the rota rotating rod, what, and we do this over time, all the way to almost a year, uh, and here shown up to 20 weeks, what you'll see that the controls stay long on the rotating rod. The attacks in one poly-Q expansion animals, they stay very less and deteriorate with time, but the poly-Q expanded that cannot interact with Capicua is no longer toxic. It's right here. That's the wild type and that's the expanded protein. So they behave very similar to wild type. And if we look at the Purkinje cell pathology, you can see massive Purkinje cell degeneration, but here we don't see any degeneration. So what, conclude, what we concluded from the studies is that Capicua does drive the Purkinje cell degeneration. And that's important because now we know at least the secret, at least for one protein, a taxon one, we know that if you have a, a partner that drives that, and if you disrupt that partner, you pretty much avoid the degeneration. So this tells us perhaps one way you can get cell-specific degeneration is by who is your protein talking to, who is it interacting with, and how important is that interaction. The other important conclusion from that, we can say that the poly-Q expanded attacks in one causes disease through a protein-based mechanism because the RNA is still being expressed and still highly abundant. So it's not the CUG repeat within the RNA. It's really, or it's not a RAN translation of that RNA. It's really the protein. And we have other data that also show that. I'll, I'll mention them later. And what we also learned based on everything I've shared with you so far, so when we do the gene expression analyses, the poly-Q expanded attacks in one show as many Capicua target downregulated. When we do it when it cannot interact, all of those genes were corrected. So it tells us at least through an enhanced function of attacks in one. So as we were studying these uh, and doing all these experiments, and actually the first experiment which showed us the hyperrepression enhanced function, it started to tell us, well, if it's enhanced function of ataxin 1, maybe if we can understand ataxin 1 regulation and find ways to lower ataxin 1 level, that could be a strategy to help the disease. And I'm going to share with you two stories of how we did that. The first story was done by, at the time, he was a postdoc in the lab. He now just took a faculty position at Columbia, is finding ways to find factors that regulate a taxon 1 at the post-transcriptional levels, uh, what regulates the RNA of a taxon 1. And what Alessandro discovered is that a taxon 1, which has a very long 3' uh, untranslated region, over 7.5 kBs, has uh, binding sites for pomelio 1. And if you knock out pomelio 1 in cells, you increase a taxon 1, mRNA, and protein. So this was in cells, which was fine and nice. But I felt that for us to make this believable, we have to go in vivo. And to do this, we asked Haifan Lin at Yale to share with us his pomelio 1 knockout mice, and he was generous to do so. And you'll see here that in the pomelio 1 heterozygous mice, you have 50% of the pomelio levels. And in the knockout, all pomelio levels are gone. And if you now watch what happens to endogenous ataxin 1, we're no longer speaking about poly-Q expanded ataxin 1. This is just an animal that lacks pomelio. What you'll notice, in the head, you'll see some increase of ataxin 1. And in the nulls, you see more increase. And we looked at this in the cortex and the cerebellum, and the results are similar. So here's the quantification where you see now, this is the normal levels of ataxin 1. You see the increase here and you see more increase in the knockout. So if you, and what did the animals do? The animals had terrible ataxia. They had other problems, but they clearly had ataxia and Purkinje cell degeneration. So we figured if reducing pomelio by 50%, which lead to 30% increase in ataxin 1, you get ataxia and Purkinje cell degeneration. Could this be really because of ataxin 1? because Pomelia will have many, many other targets. And the only way to prove it's really a taxon 1 is if you normalize the ataxin 1 level and ask, does the behavior rescue and does the degeneration rescue? And this is what we found out. We bred our Pomelio heterozygous mice to our ataxin 1 loss of function heterozygous mice. So you see here Pomelio heterozygosity. You can appreciate ataxin 1 levels increase. 
you see attacks in one haploinsufficiency, heterozygosity gives you 50% attacks in one. When you combine the two together, we go back to normalizing attacks in one. And what you see here, here's the wild type animals, here's the pomelio hat, and here the double hat. And the attacks in one hat have also healthy Purkinje cells. You see the double hat total rescue of the Purkinje cell degeneration. So this really told us that at least the Purkinje cell degeneration and the ataxia that were rescued by normalizing ataxin 1 were driven by a 30% increase wild type ataxin 1. We did not have to mutate ataxin 1. Now, one thing I want you to pay attention, this degree of degeneration with 30% increase of ataxin 1 manifested at 10 weeks of age. I want you to see how severe this is because later I'm going to show you in the poly-Q expansion, it's actually milder. So this is a much more severe disease than we see in the SCA1 knock in mice. So with this, we concluded that maybe mutations in Pomelio 1 could cause ataxia, human ataxia. And here again, we spent some time looking for potential patients and studying their mutations. And we found that, in fact, there are two types of mutations in Pomelio 1. There's some mutations that affect their R its RNA binding protein function, or it's a deletion of the gene. So it's a true loss of function. And those patients with haploinsufficiency had a severe syndrome that we na labeled Pomelio 1 associated developmental disability ataxia and seizures. But what was interesting, we found in one family with a dominantly inherited late onset ataxia, a much milder mutation that doesn't exactly uh, interfere as much with the function of the protein based on us measuring its targets and uh, ataxin 1. So this we call pomelio-related cerebellar ataxia. So I think by now you can appreciate that a 30% change in ataxin 1 upward change or a 50% reduction in pomelio 1 can cause severe ataxia whereas a milder mutation, probably 20 to 30% inhibition of pomelial function will give you later onset ataxia. And this is really, I would say this was the most surprising thing to me about the protein levels, where it's now a healthy ataxin one that you didn't have to mutate to see disease. But it affirmed to us that the levels of ataxin one matters, and with that we decided, okay, now we wanna use this information to see how we can modulate the course of SCA1. I mentioned to you before that Harry's lab had studied many transgenic animals where he expresses poly-Q ataxin 1 in Purkinje cells, and you see the nice degeneration here in this animal model. But Harry identified a particular phosphorylation site to Harry's lab at serine 776, whereby they showed if you mutate that serine to an alanine, even in the context of the poly-Q expansion, and even in the context of similar RNA levels, the protein is no longer toxic. So we were interested to know what's different between these two proteins, and what we discovered is that this serine is bound by protein called 1433, multiple isoforms, but particularly we focused on 1433 epsilon because we had access to a knockout mouse and we knew that there's less functional redundancy since the total null is lethal, we could study the heads of this mouse. And through cell-based studies, what we learned is that when 1433 binds a taxon 1, it retards its degradation. And what we also learned is that when the poly-Q tract is expanded, the binding of ataxin 1 to 1433 is enhanced. So this gave us a clue why we might be seeing toxicity from ataxin 1 when you have a poly-Q expansion. You're basically expanding the protein, increasing the binding to 1433, increasing the accumulation of ataxin 1, and that's leading to disease. So with this, we rationalize if we reduce 1433 levels, we should rescue some pathology. Mm -hmm. And indeed, we found if we reduced 1433 by 50%, now we can reduce ataxin 1 by 20%. And we looked at both uh, total uh, 
two Q attacks in one and 154 Q attacks in one. And both of them are reduced, as you can see, by these Western blots. And this is 1433 reduced by 50%. Behaviorally, again, we rescued the attacks here. And you can see the pathology. You can see that 20% reduction of attacks in one, the Purkinje cell de degeneration is now rescued. But what I want you to notice, this is the kind of degeneration we see in the SA1 mice at 32 <coughs> weeks. Now you recall, with 30% increase in wild type attacks in one, you saw a lot more degeneration than this. It was much more massive, which tells me that the poly-Q expansion is probably causing an increase in the 10 to 20% range because it's much milder than the expansion we saw from the wild type attacks in one. But this now gave us an entry to try to find therapeutics with the idea that if 20% reduction in attacks in one can rescue the phenotype of ataxia, maybe if we can find regulators uh, that regulate its level, that will give us insight into its biology, but it also might give us additional candidate genes for ataxia. Pomelio is one example at the transcriptional level, and hopefully therapeutic entry points for a CA1. And we decided to focus on things that change the protein level. So this is going to be now post-translational. And this is work that was done uh, by a postdoc in the lab, Jihei Park, in collaboration with Ismail Aramahi, who was at the time postdoc in Juan Botas's lab. They both collaborated to find regulators of attacks in one. So what Jihei did is she created a cell line with a reporter for protein levels of attacks in one. And basically, what you see here is she created a transgenic line that expresses DS-RED. Then there is an uh, internal ribosomal entry site where from the same plasmid, now a taxon one fused to GFP is being expressed. So the cells will make both proteins. And this way, we can monitor the ratio. And what we're looking for, typically, when because they're from the same promoter, you should have similar levels. But if we find something that decreases attacks in one, we're going to see more red, or something that increases attacks in one, we'll see more green. And this will allow us to screen for things that actually affect the level of attacks in one rather than just kill the cells or just affect the promoter driving this transgene. In parallel to this, the BOTAS lab screened the same genes that we were screening in, fruit fl in, in cells in fruit flies. And in their case, they expressed mutant attacks in one, and the fruit flies had eye degeneration. So what we ask is we want to find things that work in both systems. Because the idea, if it works in both systems, it's most likely to be robust and trustworthy. And we've done siRNA screens. We've done short hairpin screens. And I'll show you here some example of the data. Here's an example for the siRNA kinome screen you'll see that there were 10 genes shared between the fruit fly screen and the mouse screen. And here's a short hairpin screen, pooled screen, and you'll see, again, some shared uh, genes. Here are some of these shared genes. MSK1, MSK2 are among them. PKA is amongst them. But here's the bigger picture. Many of these genes work within one pathway. So MSK is at the bottom of that pathway. So when you find 10 genes from two system, totally disparate species, and they work in the same pathway, that's to me what makes the data trustworthy. Now, how does this pathway impact a taxon one stability? Well, we got maybe a little bit lucky here in that we, we did mass spec and asked, do any of the kinases we identified in this screen phosphorylate attacks in one, and MSK1, the one in that pathway, was the primary kinase that phosphorylated serine 776, as you can see here in the red. And PKA1 was a second kinase. So discovering, we also found RSK, but the majority of the phosphorylation happened with MSK1. And we've done a lot of study to, to prove that MSK1 can impact the level of attacks in one only if it can be phosphorylated. We then went in vivo. There are two paralogs to MSK1, MSK2. Uh, and we, when we take away one copy of each, you see the animals are healthy. When we take now attacks in one expressing mice with 
Purkinje cell degeneration, if you have no modifier here, or one copy is maybe slight reduction in degeneration, but when you take one copy of each, we see a very nice rescue of the degeneration, as well as a rescue of the ataxia. So what this told us is MSK1 then is a wonderful target to explore potentially for lowering ataxin 1 levels. And for this, one can test MSK1 inhibitors. And uh, we chose to do that on eye neurons from patients with SCA1. We also generated now a mouse. I mentioned to you how to use transgenic mice. Now we've made knock-in mice that have an alanine mutation on the polycule expanded allele. And I don't have time to show the data. It's new work. But at least we do rescue the cerebellar phenotype as well. So uh, what happens if you add a tool compound to uh, iPSC-derived neurons? You see that you can nicely inhibit the phosphorylation of MSK1, which is required for its activity. But we also th we level lower the level of human ataxin 1 in human patients. So with this background, you could see now why this is, makes it worthwhile developing an inhibitor to MSK1 and see if we can use that, uh, hopefully, to help SCA1 patients. Um, one thought we had is that, so we know MSK1 regulates attacks in one, but we know other targets must, must also regulate it. And we are aware that these are chronic diseases, and if you want to inhibit a pathway in a disease for 40 years, you better be sure that's safe. We do know that the MSK1, MSK2 double heterozygous knockout are healthy. MSK1 knockout are not terribly sick, but still, that's a lot. So what we rationalize that perhaps if we can partially inhibit one or two targets, that may be a good thing. And recall, I mentioned to you that PKA1 also phosphorylated attacks in one. So here we use tool compound to inhibit either PKA or MSK1 or the two together. And you will see that the two together has a, have a much more potent effect. And hopefully that would reduce the toxicity. And since then, we've broadened our screen to about 7,800 genes, uh, what we call this the druggable genomes, uh, Steve Elledge helped make these libraries with short hairpins. And in this case, we do now the screening where we infect the different libraries and sort the cells uh, and sequence them to, and decode which short hairpin RNAs are enriched uh, where ataxin 1 has been lowered. And then we put these through the fly studies and through human eye neurons. And now we're at a stage we're testing some of the candidates in vivo and the animal model. Our idea would be if we can find two to three targets that we can inhibit cooperatively, we can start with MSK1 to develop a drug, but one could maybe do two or three drugs. So from the SCA1 studies then, I hope I convinced you that we learned uh, that the molecular mechanism, at least driving the disease in the cerebellum, is enhanced function of ataxin 1 capicua. This is what contributes to cerebellar pathology, and it is capicua is required for Purkinje cell pathology. I don't have time to show the data, and it's still work in progress. It is not what's driving the disease in the brainstem. Why do I know this? Because when we lower capicua levels, we slightly lengthen. The, the half life, uh, the life of the animals, we don't cure them. So there are other drivers, and we're now pursuing these other interactors. And regarding what can we do about the course of the disease, we hope that if we can partially lowering a taxin one using therapeutics that either target the modulators or a taxin one or both, we can perhaps help this disease. So this is what we've learned from SCA1, and I hope that. Other investigators working on other degenerative diseases will think about really exploring the normal function of the proteins, their partners, what drive the cell-specific degeneration. But what we also learned, that, which I'm sure you appreciate, that protein levels matter. I showed you the poly Q expansion stabilizes the protein, but we know now that ataxin 1 levels by themselves, the higher, the worse is the disease. And this really made us think about other disease drivers. We know that APP duplication can cause dementia. We know people with Down syndrome, they have an extra copy of chromosome 21 where APP is localized and these people have 
dementia at a younger age, in their 40s, and they have the same pathology that actually you see in sporadic disease. So somehow we know APP is a driver, and there are a couple of individuals that have the trisomy minus the APP locus, and they don't have Alzheimer's. So we do know APP is actually the driver. We know that levels and isoform splice changes in tau can drive neurodegeneration. And also we know in synuclein, a driver of Parkinson's disease, having an extra copy of the wild type protein. You don't have to mutate the protein, you can have degeneration. So knowing that all these proteins can drive degeneration without even mutating them, we decided to look at <coughs> modulators of these proteins as a therapeutic entry point for these diseases. And we figured, at worst, we learn something about the biology of what regulates these proteins. And at best, we might find targets that might help in these diseases. So here again, we did the same strategy, collaborating with the BOTAS lab, where they did all the screen of flies, and we did it in human cells. And I just want to show you some of the cool things we do with the flies. These are the tau flies. And you, you can see how they have a problem in that they are slower in climbing. So we use that when you have a modifier. We not only look at the fly eye, but we, see, we try to see if the modifier now will allow this fly to climb much faster. So this allows sensitive quantification. And when we did that, um, I guess I, sorry about this. I, that's okay. One of the candidates we identified is a kinase that we discovered using mass spec, it phosphorylate tau at serine 356. Now, tau has been studied extensively. Many kinases have been identified that phosphorylated. This kinase was not known to regulate it. So this is the beauty of unbiased screen. We're new to the field, we just did it in a blinded way, and it came about. And what you see here, when we mapped it to serine 356, if we use a wild type NOAC, you'll see increased phosphorylation, but if you mutate NOAC, the protein is no longer phosphorylated. But the, it has no effect on uh, other phosphorylation sites on tau. And then we explore the mechanism by which NOAC retards the turnover. Uh, what does it do to uh, at, uh, uh, tau? And what you see here, if you have wild type tau and NOAC, you'll see the half-life of protein. This is a doxycycline inducible protein. And you see when you don't have NOAC, it turns over by 48 hours and 60 hours, almost gone. If you have NOAC, it now, the clearance is lower. However, if the serine is mutated, NOAC no longer has an effect. And this is shown here in the graphs, where if it's an alanine mutant, it has a much shorter half-life whereas if uh, it has NOAC, that lengthens the half type from the wild type uh, protein. So with this, we decided to test that in animal models, and I'm just gonna summarize the data. When we bred these mice, lacking one copy of NOAC1 to mice that express toxic tau protein, these animals have degeneration. We found we decreased the phosphorylation and tau levels in these mice. We restored learning and memory restored synaptic plasticity. This is in vivo, long-term potentiation study. You see the tau animals have decreased LTP over several days, and all the others are controls which look inseparable. So the NOAC tau double mutants are inseparable. We reduce the pathology and we improve survival by months. So this gave us our a, another target that's now being pursued to potentially see if this would be helpful to reduce tau toxicity in people at risk and people perhaps with high levels of tau in their CSF. And eventually, uh, the screen were done on APP and tau by Gion Kim and Ismail and Ramahi that they identified multiple modulators. And just want to show you here an example. You recall I told you when you find modulators in a pathway, you gain confidence. Here's an example in, for multiple enzyme in a sumo conjugating pathway, which upon knockdown of these genes, you'll see a reduction of tau levels. This is the control, vinculin here for a control. This is the negative targeting short hair pattern RNAs. And this is uh, UB21 targeting, you see reduction of tau, AOS1, also reduction, and here's the quantification. So 
basically many of these the black bars are the negative controls and all of these within the same pathway shows you that actually we are pulling genes that work in a pathway that regulate tau levels. So what do you do when you have so many candidates? You pick some of the ones that you think may be safe to modulate, and you now want to test them in vivo. We can't do everything like we did for NOAC, bring the knockout mice, do genetic interactions. We began now to use AAV viruses at P0 to monitor the levels of tau by knocking down these genes in vivo. And this is some example of the data. TRIM28 is, uh, a, has multiple functions, but one of its function is a ligase activity. And you can see here how knockdown of this gene can reduce tau levels. This is un negative control, and this is the TRIM28 knockdown. And here's some example of additional genes where we can see this is targeting tau directly in the mice. But here's some other short hairpin is targeting some of the other candidates. And we see at least 20% reduction. And that's really what we're aiming for. We don't need much more than that. So what we think is that these genetic screens are going to be extremely helpful, not only to give us maybe insight into the regulators of tau or APP or any of those proteins. Uh, we have discovered NOAC1, TRIM28. There are others in the works. But what they will also give us is candidate genetic risk factors. You can envision that inhibition of NOAC uh, will reduce tau levels. That might suggest that a, a mutation that causes constitutive increased activity of the enzyme might increase the risk of someone for Alzheimer. Or if we find something that normally will destabilize NOAC, and when you inhibit it, now tau levels will go up, this will tell you that loss of function of those genes will be genetic risk factor. So I think the beauty of this approach, as we go through these modifiers of tau levels in either direction, it can help others who are doing a lot of sequencing in Alzheimer's patients identify risk factors. Because you sequence people with Alzheimer's disease, it's not usually like autism, a trio, where you say, here's a de novo mutation. It's easy to pinpoint. You're going to see variations. They may be in the parent, and the parent will not have symptoms. But at least if you see some variation and you know there's some biological function in some of these genes that they may regulate tau levels or APP levels, then that gets to, move, to be moved up on the priority list. And my last slide is to show you it wasn't really by design, but this is biology. Here are more proteins <laughs> that their protein levels matter. So we talked about ataxin 1, where uh, I showed you that 30% increase, uh, some increase causes uh, a C1. And hopefully, I convinced you that through Pomelio, it's also contributing. And Pomelio 1, of course, we know that the milder mutation causes late onset, but haploinsufficiency, severe onset. And here's synuclein. The duplications or triplications have different severity. This is a triplication. They have the most severe form. And then APP, of course, we know uh, extra copies cause early onset disease. So I think it's really important to pay attention to protein levels. One thing I would say, many of us used to think enzymes, if you lack one allele, it's probably OK. You still have plenty enzyme activity. Well, I don't think this is, we can say this safely anymore. Because in Parkinson's disease, GBA, haploinsufficiency, which you know loss of GBA caused lysosomal storage disease, but loss of one allele in the parents of these children is proving to cause in increased risk. About a third of these individuals will develop Parkinson's disease because of some subtle effect on lysosomal function. So I have really learned from all the studies, this, you learn about pretty much all but one protein. Uh, atonal is transcription factor I work on. But all the other proteins I work on, you've seen now how every one of them is doser sensitive. And I don't have the data. That's another hour. But it turns out atonal haploinsufficiency causes loss of inner ear hair cell indefiniteness. So that's another doser sensitive gene. So I think that we really learn to respect that we need to pay attention. Small changes have big effects. And I hope uh, these data would convince you. Uh, I mentioned the people who've done the work as we've gone along. I think the one person I didn't mention is Christian Lazania-Reeves, who worked on the NOAC1 story.
but all the others, and of course my collaboration with Harry, which has been really very exciting and precious, and similarly with Juan Botas through all the nice fly work he's done, and our computational biology collaborators led by Jean Donglu. And we have many clinical co collaborators who helped us with the POMON clinical study, including Kim Boycott, who led the study on the dominant ataxia. And of course, I'm grateful to the funders, NIH, IDDRC, Ataxia Foundation, and various consortia, including um, Belfer Foundation and the Peak Hour Foundation. Thank you very much. OK, time for questions. Yes, Anita. That's a good question. The, by specificity, you mean if you inhibit NOAC1, how do you know you're not affecting something else, right? right? One thing we, we propose, and we did a lot of study, those, I don't want to say boring, but I don't think there's studies you want to hear about. What we did is we brought, in, we, we proposed as we're working to develop the pharmaceutical industry develop in, inhibitors, we said we don't have to have total inhibition of the enzyme, partial. So let's look at the partial inhibition. So at least we look to the best of our ability in two areas, humans and mice. What we found in humans, there are many individuals who are healthy, who are, uh, have lots of function alleles of NOAC1, and they're adults and they have no problems. These are people who are in the exact database. There are several of them. And if you look at the exact database, NOAC1 is called mutation tolerant in the sense they, they saw the expected amount of loss of function mutations, the expected amount of missense mutation throughout the gene. So that gives us confidence that at least the human being who lack one copy of this gene are healthy. So maybe if you inhibit it by 50%, as best as we can tell, that's okay. In the mouse, we did additional studies on the heterozygous mice, basically putting them through every potential assay, you can do cardiovascular, put them on high fat diet, stress them, wound heal, et cetera. We did all that. And I think that this is what gives us hope that that partial inhibition would be okay. I would go further and I would say, I would be thrilled if I can find another target and where the two conversion attacks in one, and now I don't even have to inhibit NOAC 150%, maybe 30%. Just like we titrate blood pressure medications, we should really start thinking, titration combination. I know it's not the norms, nobody wanna hear about this, neither the pharmaceutical companies nor the FDA, but I think if we're really gonna be serious of treating these diseases in a preventative way rather than once the symptoms set in, which means I'm gonna take a healthy individual who we know has the SCA1 mutation, who hasn't manifested any symptoms, they're 30 years old and tell them for the next 70 years you're gonna be on medicine, i much rather give them a combination and milder dosage of something chronically than any one system. Because the odds of these two systems impinging on many other proteins are, is now reduced. So this is my vision. I, I'm not saying my vision will be appreciated by everyone in, in the pharmaceutical, maybe, and regulatory agencies, but I think it's begin to start this conversation, and I hope that data will convince people down the line that this is a good way to go. Speak up after. Uh, I'll repeat the question. For um, polyq containing transcription factors and cofactors in uh, ataxia, for example, where you have polyq between repeats. Mm -hmm. uh, you didn't mention any of those things, and yet there was work by Tijan back in yes. the 90s, which argued for sequestration models. Like Do you see a role for those in, in your. So that's a really good question. I think. Uh, I appreciate the question, which is getting back at, could it be that the polyq expansion is really titrating factors, some transcription factors? And it may be in other disorders. Uh, remember, a lot of studies were done in the past using either overexpression systems, 
or sometimes using systems that may be heterologous or not the full length protein. All I can speak to is the SCA1 model where we've done it in the context of the full length protein. And what we've learned is that you can have all the cues you want, but if you now change one amino acid, serine 776, or change the interaction with Capicua, you're not gonna have disease. So all, what a, this poly-Q expansion really plays a role in titrating some things. Maybe we don't see that in the lifespan in the mouse. Maybe in a human, it's still in action. But at least we know that the pathology, even in the face of massive expression, when Harry did it with the Purkinje cells, but full context of a protein, we didn't see the pathology anymore. So I, I tend to think it's really more, I think this is what's happening. I think the poly-Q expansion, it's changing the conformation of the protein, enhancing some binding activities perhaps, retarding slightly its clearance, and eventually the disease is via the gain of function of that. And I think the androgen receptor supports this because many elegant studies were done by people studying spinal bulb or muscular atrophy where the poly-Q expansion is within the androgen receptor, which show it's really about the normal function of the protein. Because if you now take away the androgen, uh, the ligand, you no longer have the toxicity. So it's not that the protein itself is doing something wrecking having. It's really when it binds its ligands, goes into the nucleus and does what it has to do. And we know it's a gain of function because people who lack the receptor, they have a different disease. They have testicular feminization syndrome where they're sterile, have female-like features. In, they don't have motor neuron degeneration. In the poly especially, you have partial loss of function, just like we saw some of the Capicua target, but that doesn't seem to be what's contributing to the disease. And you had a comment? Oh, yeah, right. Right. And I wondered whether the mechanism behind it, which isn't well characterized at all in terms of the ataxia, mm. could be a subtle increase in, in some of the ataxins. I mean, many of these ataxins are abundant in Purkinje cells. So it could be that you might increase two to three of these ataxins just a little bit, because m many of them are proteins that are degraded via the proteasome pathway. That is true. And then, you know, when you stop the treatment, they might improve. That could be possibly. We, we did show that attacks and one is degraded via the proteasome pathway. Was, so you saw this TALL cancer in yes. this one patient. Is that the only cancer or are there other no. kinds of cancers? Yeah, thank you for asking the question. The question is, do we see other cancers? So we did not, because we only looked at children and these children with development disability, but Capicua is now pretty much known to be loss of function. It is a tumor suppressor gene. Loss of function can cause a variety of cancers, for sure oligodendrogliomas, so if you lose Capicua. I, I thought you, you have to have nerve, <laughs> neural tumors with this. You talk about nerves and then you go into the blood. So you, right, you know, right, 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 right. So I think there are people <laughs> that have mutations that have, uh, you know, loss of function mutation and they have additional they cancers, definitely. Thank you. I, I, I think I feel better. Yeah, right. <laughs> Life makes sense. Right. <laughs> yeah. I'm also wondering about retinal degeneration. So the question is, is there retinal degeneration in SCA1 or any of these models? Not in SCA1, in SCA7. We, we Publish on that, another repeat expansion disorder, that disease causes retinal degeneration and ataxia. But SCA1, neither the humans nor the mice have retinal degeneration. There was one question in the back. 
so I can speak to attacks in one. So the question is, can the mouse help us model this dosage sensitivity? I can only speak to attacks in one because, as you recall, it was the 30% increase in the mouse endogenous attacks in one that led to Purkinje cell degeneration. So clearly here, the mouse was sensitive to the dosage of this protein. Um, and we also know from the SCA1 situation that when we reduced the poly-Q expanded attacks one by 20%, we were able to rescue the ataxia. So I think it's safe to say for SCA1, for this ataxia one protein, somehow it's the mouse that revealed to us the dosage sensitivity for ataxia one and also for Pomelia1. Um, I couldn't say the same for many other protein. I can tell you for Capicua, Haplo insufficiency of Capicua causes increase in activity, which the humans have hyperactive, but it didn't cause the learning and memory. We only saw the learning and memory in the mouse when both alleles of Capicua were deleted in the forebrain. So for some proteins, it's easy to see. For others, it's not. You may have to lose both alleles to learn that this is an important protein. Then you discover your human counterpart to be you know, haplo insufficient. So can I ask one last question? So it's, um, in trying to move forward with tau and its regulation, what's the simplest and quickest model to test that in that has biological relevance? I mean, we use a model that was developed by Virginia Lee that she ex uh, uh, expresses one of the human disease-causing tau mutation uh, at a proline 301 position. This is called the P19 line. The reason we use this mouse is because it starts manifesting pathology and behavior problem after six months of age. You need to age it to six to nine months of age, but that's better than the other oh, model that takes much longer. Right. I was thinking, I mean, I want to do it in flies, personally. <laughs> oh, flies, there are, there, Juan Botas has flies that overexpress tau and they have neuronal degeneration, and it was, the flies did discover NOAC1, yeah. and we discovered that lo it lowers protein. If you inhibit NOAC1, you inhibit protein levels of tau in those flies is reduced, but not the RNA. So it's really So you can move forward with that. Yeah. So we do it in parallel, but you're, nobody's going to want to, you know, follow up further for drug development until you really nail a mechanism and do mm -hmm. it in a mammal. So yes, this, everything we do is first cells and flies. Mm -hmm. Super. Any other burning or not so burning, smoldering questions? <laughs> yeah. Mm. Right. That's really an interesting question. I don't have a very direct, clear mechanism that downstream, but I can tell you there are quite a few gene expression changes downstream of the Capicua attacks in one complex that are altered. Uh, there are also some genes that are critical for calcium homeostasis that are altered and some genes are critical for neurotransmission uh, respond to, you know, stim neurotransmission that are altered. So I cannot tell you if any one of those, all of those, once we see that there's so many genes changing, we don't go by one gene and say, this is the gene that's really driving it. We think it's the combination. And we know that when you prohibit the interaction with Capicua, all of these correct. So we, we think these are the downstream mediators. We have a candidate there. there we, we just published those. But I don't know that any one of them is a major driver. It's hard for me to envision one single driver. No, that's, that's an interesting question. The question is, do we know the pattern of degeneration? Um, I can tell you in humans what you see is some abnormal axons with torpedoes bodies called torpedo bodies, which contain, we looked at them by EM, they contain mitochondria and some other cellular material, but for sure there's mitochondria trapped in the axons that, you know, probably can't move along the axons as well. So we know the axons are altered and there's some axonal degeneration. In the mice, we've only focused on looking at the dendrites. We see loss of dendrites quite early uh, in the process. And 
as the disease progresses, you lose the cell body. But what I cannot tell you, if the axon happens before, we have not looked as deeply in the mouse. So if you tether ataxia to other transcription factors, does it t t turn into, a, is it a co-repressor? Um, we don't, we, we don't know per se if it is a core repressor uh, with other factors. We know for sure with ca Capicua is a core repressor, although we do see some genes going down when you knock out Capicua. So I, I cannot be 100% sure it's purely that. But we have not identified, uh, ROR alpha has been shown to interact with ataxin 1, uh, but we don't know for sure really how much those contribute to the disease, since now we know that at least in the Purkinje cell, Capicua is sufficient. We have not pursued this any further. W in the brainstem, we don't know. We're just beginning to IP the partners in the brainstem to see if we can find a key one driving the disease. Any smoldering questions? <laughs> Let us thank Huda again for a wonderful <laughs> second lecture as well as...